Good evening. My name is Jonathan Mavroidis. I'm with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. If you haven't had a chance, uh, you ought to tour through the library because we're going to close soon for renovation. Um, we're going through a $25 million renovation. We're going to be reopened next year, fall of 2016. So just uh, tour through the gallery in the next couple of weeks, take it all in and learn a little bit more about our 37th president. We have a few special guests in the audience. Uh, Ed Nixon, the president's younger brother. We also have Mike Elzey, the director of the Nixon Presidential Library. And I just want to tell everyone about some of our uh, very exciting list of upcoming events this fall. Um, on Monday, October 12th, we'll have Ann Romney, uh, the former First Lady of Massachusetts. And she's going to talk about, in this together, my story um, about her battle with multiple sclerosis. On Monday, October 19th, we're going to have Luke Nichter, a scholar from Texas A&M, and he'll talk about his second installment of the Nixon tapes in 1973. On Monday, October 26th, we're going to have Yoki Driesen. He's the managing editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, and he's going to talk about his book, The Invisible Front, Love and Loss in an Endless War, and it's about the epidemic and growing awareness of PTSD and military suicides. And then on Tuesday, October 27th, we're going to have Fred Barnes and Mort Kondracki. Um, you know them in Fox News, formerly on Fox News, the Beltboy, Beltway Boys. And they're going to talk about their new biography about Jack, Jack Kemp. It's called The Bleeding Heart Conservative Who Changed America. And on Thursday, October 29th, we're going to have Jack Pitney, a Claremont uh, McKenna professor. And he's going to talk about the politics uh, of autism, his, his new book about that. And how many people are members here? That's it. <laughs> you, can, you can receive significant discounts um, if you become a member. We put um, a membership brochure on your seat. And it really helps us promote the timeless policies of President Nixon. Um, it keeps the library a vibrant educational center. And it keeps uh, the great uh, speaker series we have with incredible leaders and intellectuals like you'll hear about tonight. And our, my colleague Ian Delzer will be in the lobby to um, accept um, those brochures if you choose to become a member. Thank you. Now on to our speaker. You know our speaker because he's brilliant. Educated at Oxford, he's also had posts at Oxford, Cambridge, and the London School of Economics. He's now the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History at Harvard University and the William Ziegler Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. He's the author of several very serious bestsellers, including the one he'll talk about tonight. It's called Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. It's about the early life of, of Henry Kissinger and his pre-White House years as, uh, before he becomes President Nixon's National Security Advisor and later Secretary of State. It's the first of a two-volume comprehensive work in which he received unprecedented access to Dr. Kissinger's papers. In a New York Times review, it said that the second volume of Kissinger is, if, if the second volume of Kissinger is anywhere as comprehensive, well-written, riveting as the first, this will be his masterpiece. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Ferguson. Thank you very much indeed, John, and thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming tonight. I was trying to work out how best to begin, and I decided it might be a good idea to read a short passage uh, from the book, which, needless to say, does touch on the life of Richard Nixon, as well as on the life of Henry Kissinger. So let me quote what I wrote about the man uh, in whose library we find ourselves. Like Kissinger, and unlike Rockefeller, Richard Nixon was born with no silver spoon in his mouth. <laughs> 
His father ran a grocery and gas station in Whittier to the southeast of Los Angeles. Two of his three brothers died before he graduated from college. Like Kissinger, Nixon was raised in a religiously conservative family. As a college senior, he recalled how biblical literalism had been, quote, ground into me by his, quote, fundamental Quaker parents who had warned me against science. Like Kissinger, he was highly intelligent, an academic performer. Indeed, he would also have gone to Harvard had his father not needed him to help with the family store, confining him to Whittier College. Like Kissinger, too, he was a worker, quote, pushing himself very hard on principle, thinking erroneously that he performs best out on the borderline of fatigue when he, was, when he has worried a thing to its bitter end. And like Kissinger, he had suffered a crisis of religious faith as a young man. Exposure at Whittier to Hume, Mill, and other philosophers led him to exclaim at the age of 20, I am no longer a seven dayer. I am no longer a fundamentalist. I have not resisted the heresies of college professors. <laughs> Even more striking is the fact that as a young man, Nixon also considered himself an idealist even quoting Kant as offering the best way of reconciling philosophical knowledge with the existence of God. He was filled with admiration for Woodrow Wilson, despite the fact that, like most Americans in the early 1930s, he regarded the US entry into World War I as a ghastly mistake and had only started, that had only started the wheels of industry rolling toward another great war. In his soul-searching senior year essay, what can I believe? Nixon urged the application of Christ's teaching in the international field. Quote, Repeal the obnoxious features of the Versailles Treaty. Disarm all the nations of the world as fast as is humanly possible. Re-establish the League of Nations for all nations and add a world court for economic disputes to our present court. This is Richard Nixon. Put the machinery in motion for a huge program of educational scientific propaganda whose purpose it will be to draw the peoples of the earth closer together. Work for the eventual abolishment of tariffs and immigration restrictions. I believe that all the problems of the world can be solved by courts of investigation which would consider the individual conflicts and render advisory decisions. I envision a world in which there are no walls between nations no racial hatreds, no armaments. I see a world in which each nation produces the best it can in the field of economics, art, music, etc. I see a world where men and women of all nationalities travel together, eat together, even live together. I see a world which cooperates, which strives upward to the final highest values of life. One of the joys of being a historian is that you're constantly surprised. No one is quite as you expect them to be. And each book I write is a new voyage of discovery. I was asked by Henry Kissinger to write his biography. It was his idea. And I said no. I thought it would be intolerably difficult. I thought of a great mountain of documents and telephone transcripts. And then I thought of a great horde of hostile critics whose minds had already been made up about him. It seemed a supremely thankless task. Dr. Kissinger sent me one of those letters that he sends people. Dear Neil, he said, I'm very sorry to hear about your decision. Just when I had made up my mind that you were the perfect man for the job, 
And just when I had found 150 boxes of papers that I thought I had lost, well, I fell for it. Hoop, <laughs> line and sinker, and within a few days I was sitting at his home in Kent, Connecticut, looking through these documents. And within a few hours of doing that, I realized that I had to write this book because what I found was so completely different from what I had expected. Let me try and give you a sense of the thrill of that, that moment of, of discovery. I found, I found an essay that he had written, two pages, with the title, The Eternal Jew, writing down his recollection of witnessing the liberation of a concentration camp in Germany in 1945, written at the time, probably a day later, when he was in a US Army uniform. And it's addressed to one of the liberated inmates, a Pole. It's an incredibly moving, startling document because Kissinger is able to put himself in Fulek Sama's place. Of course he is. Because just seven years before, he had been a German Jew and had only just escaped from Nazi Germany with his parents and his younger brother in the nick of time. Then I found a letter that he'd written to his parents just three years later, shortly after his return from occupied Germany, at a time when he must have already have begun studying at Harvard. It's a letter that reveals a breach between him and his parents, a breach uh, over religion, because, as I later discovered, during the war, Henry Kissinger had lost his religious faith, as indeed had his brother. And this letter goes something like this. To you, there's only black and white. But to me, there are multiple shades of gray in between. It's a searing letter. It's heartrending. And it's written by a 25-year-old returned veteran trying to explain to his deeply orthodox parents why he has lost his faith. Fast forward. You've got to picture me um, rummaging around in boxes uh, in, in a bedroom. And I find a document dated 1965, and it's Henry Kissinger's diary of a first visit to Vietnam. He went to Vietnam at the invitation of uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was then ambassador to Saigon, to South Vietnam, because he understood that this was to be the defining foreign policy issue of the time. And he felt he had to go there and to understand better, to see for himself what was happening. It is a devastating diary that he kept really for his own personal use. As he traveled around from Saigon and then uh, into more dangerous territory, although Saigon at that time was pretty dangerous because there were quite frequent terrorist attacks, as he flew out in helicopters to the more beleaguered outposts of the South Vietnamese regime, where the Viet Cong ruled at night, he began to see that the war was not winnable. 
1965. By the end of the trip, as the diary makes clear, he had concluded there was no military victory to be had because of chronic dysfunction of the South Vietnamese regime, but also of the way in which the US military was waging the war. This I had not expected. So I began to work on the biography. And I spent a long time gathering material, accumulating documents, not only from his private papers, but from about 49 other archives, in the belief that one could only really understand this man if one saw him from, from multiple vantage points, including foreign vantage points, the other side's view of him. And I came to realize that I had an extraordinary story to tell. This is only the first half of Kissinger's life. But it's almost exactly half. And it's a reminder that for half this 92-year-old's life, he was not a statesman, a diplomat, a national security advisor. He was an academic. But he wasn't just an academic. He was a refugee who at 15 fled with his parents and started a new life from scratch in the United States of America. Refugees are much in the news these days, not least in Europe. Henry Kissinger was a refugee. And the story of how he started over with scarcely more than the most rudimentary English learnt in South Germany, how he worked nights uh, in high school and during the day made shaving brushes uh, and delivered them in Manhattan. This in itself is a quintessentially American story and a very moving one. The contrast between Nazi Germany and uh, the 1930s United States is a startling one. Yeah. And at every turn, what I tried to do was to contextualize his experience. Because to me, as I guess I'm a baby boomer, born 1964, I think I just qualify. These are lost worlds, lost worlds. To be a German Jew in foot in the late 1920s and early 1930s, it's a lost world. To find yourself in Washington Heights as a refugee with nothing in 1938, that too is a lost world. And then, Henry Kissinger became a soldier. And this is an important part of the story. As it was for every one of that generation who served in the armed forces. The war was transformative. After he was conscripted, Kissinger found himself in a series of, a series of pretty hellish situations. And I'm only talking about the training camps in Louisiana. <laughs> But he also found himself in an amazing institution, the US Army, one of the great leveling institutions of all time, which took people from all walks of life, of every conceivable creed, of every ethnic background, and lumped them all together and turned them into an army capable of defeating Nazi Germany. That stuff alone is extraordinary. Picture Henry Kissinger, the young, thin Henry Kissinger. Oh, yes, the pictures show, thin, in a troop ship heading across the Atlantic, not long after D-Day. Picture him going ashore and finding himself, within a matter of a few days, at the front line on German soil. not far from the Siegfried line, and writing home to his parents. It's late 1944, I am back. I have returned. I am back on German soil. And now I see 
what they have brought upon themselves. Not only was he a soldier who, who suffered some really close scrapes at the Battle of the Bulge, he then became a counterintelligence agent, a Nazi hunter whose job it was to hunt down the most culpable offenders in the Nazi regime, interrogate them. And he's doing this at age 22. He calls himself Mr. Henry. He doesn't want the Germans to know that he's a German Jew. Speaks only in English. Of course the locals knew. He finds Smokey the dog. One of my favorite characters in the book is Smokey the dog. The dog he finds in Paris, buys, falls in love with. There's a German girlfriend too. That's part of the crisis within the family. He doesn't bring the German girlfriend back, but Smokey the dog, yes. <laughs> In everybody's life, there's at least one mentor. There were several mentors in Henry Kissinger's life, and perhaps the most extraordinary was Fritz Kramer, another German exile from the Third Reich, who, in the US Army, they were both privates, identified Kissinger's intellectual farpar, his talent, and told him, in long walks that they would take behind the lines or in training camps, you must go to one of the great universities. After the war, you need to apply to the Ivy League. That's what you must do. It had never crossed Kissinger's mind. He does it. He applies far too late to all the Ivy Leagues. They all turn him down except Harvard. Flat fast forward, and it's 1948. Suddenly, he's an undergraduate at Harvard. It's as if this man has lived already three lives before he's even hit 30. And he encounters a man named William Yandel Elliot, a bombastic Southern professor, an Anglophile, who tells him, just to get rid of him, go and read Kant. This is what you do if a student turns up and says, I'm your tutee and you're rather busy. Oh, go and read Kant and come back when you've done that and you expect never to see them again. <laughs> Not Kissinger. Back he comes. And ends up writing as an undergraduate an enormously long senior thesis with the modest title, The Meaning of History. <laughs> I think the the academic career of Henry Kissinger uh, is fascinating, not because of the academic politics. You know his famous line about academic politics is so poisonous because the stakes are so low. <laughs> it's more the intellectual breakthroughs he achieved. I'm going to tell you four things that I learned from reading Henry Kissinger's early work. Not so much the meaning of history, which is pretty unreadable, uh, but the first book, the dissertation originally, that became a world restored, and all the subsequent books and articles and the unpublished papers, and I read my way through the lot. Here are the four things that I take away from it. History, Kissinger says, is to nations what character is to people. To individuals. If you don't know history, you don't really know what's motivating the other side. Imagine trying to understand, just to give you a contemporary example, Vladimir Putin without knowing any Russian history, <laughs> or Xi Jinping without knowing any Chinese history. Kissinger's unusual in his generation because he really believes that history matters. His contemporaries at Harvard want to do rocket science. They want to do economics, social science, political science. It's just got to be science. And Kissinger says, no, we need to study history. 
because that's the key to understanding our world. That's a hugely important, if simple, insight. It was a very contrarian position to take in the early 1950s. He wrote a dissertation about the Congress of Vienna. The central characters are Metternich and Kasselry. When Eliot, his professorial mentor, tried to get him a job at MIT, the MIT faculty just laughed. The idea that anybody could have wasted their time studying the early 19th century in the atomic age, which had rendered all history obsolete, just seemed absurd. Second insight. What Kissinger calls the problem of conjecture. The problem of conjecture is a hugely important idea, no matter what kind of a decision maker you are, whether it's a presidential decision maker or something much humbler. What is the problem? The problem of conjecture is this. When you make a difficult decision, that involves some upfront cost to avoid a worse outcome further on in the future. The payoffs are lopsided. Because if you're right, and you've done the right thing, and you avert catastrophe, nobody thanks you. Nobody is grateful to Richard Nixon for the fact that World War III did not happen in the 1970s. The problem of conjecture is that if you do the difficult thing that averts catastrophe, the payoff is minimal. It's much easier to do nothing, these days we say kick the can down the road, and just hope that things will be okay. You might get lucky. Some presidents are lucky. But then again, as Kissinger says, you might be like those people who kicked the can down the road in the 1930s, hoping that Hitler was just a normal German nationalist and not a genocidal maniac. They found out that he was a genocidal maniac, and 50 million people lost their lives. So the problem of conjecture is a really important Kissinger idea. And it leads to the third idea I want to tell you about that I learned from him. And that is that most choices in the realm of foreign policy are between evils. You don't get nice, easy, morally comfortable, touchy-feely options that often. Mostly you're choosing between bad, worse, and worst. And Kissinger says in Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, it is a moral act to choose the lesser of two evils. But again, don't expect any thanks. The final idea, which really came from reading a book about Bismarck that he didn't publish, is that if you are a completely calculating realist, if you are somebody who says the national interest is all that matters, I will do whatever it takes to promote that national interest, no matter how callous and ruthless, duplicitous and two-faced I have to be. Kissinger argues, with respect to Bismarck, this is not in fact a sustainable foreign policy. It won't have legitimacy. You won't carry people with you. And ultimately, his critique of Bismarck is that Bismarck created an unsustainable system. Now, this is pretty surprising when you think about it, because it sounds like Henry Kissinger is arguing against what Henry Kissinger is supposed to believe. To read most books about him, you would think he was the arch-realist, the American Machiavelli, the American Bismarck. Devious, duplicitous, two-faced, unprincipled, all the things that have been written by writers like Christopher Hitchens and Seymour Hirsch. And yet the Kissinger that I reveal in this book repudiates realism 
and is in fact far more an idealist. The subtitle of The Idealist is not just designed to infuriate readers of the New York Times, though it certainly <laughs> does have that effect. It's also designed to make a really important point about him, which I think, in fact, applies to Richard Nixon too. We cannot understand these men as cynical, unscrupulous, Machiavellian figures. Rather, we must recognize that they were idealists in at least three senses of the word. They were idealists in the sense of philosophy. They read Kant and took to heart Kant's fundamental insight about freedom as something that we experience when we exercise free choice. But they were idealists in other ways, too. They regarded realism as having failed in the 1930s. There's a great line in the book that I quote in which Kissinger says, the appeasers thought that they were hard-headed realists. These men had learnt through their own experience in the 1930s and in the 1940s the terrible costs of foreign policy failure. And they were idealists in a third respect. Henry Kissinger deeply rejected the notion that materialism makes the world go round, that it's all about economics, that the Cold War was just a contest between two economic systems, one communist, one capitalist, and the better one would win. Many people today think that the Cold War was about that. In fact, I would say the conventional wisdom in the United States today is that the Cold War was an economic contest and the United States won it economically. Kissinger was deeply hostile to this view from the outset. He argued, even in his senior thesis, that we should reject totalitarianism even if it's economically superior. That we should base our claims for freedom not on economic efficiency but on something higher than that on the superiority of freedom itself, as an end in itself. This resonated with me the more I read. It seemed to me that in this respect, in understanding that the Cold War was a contest of ideas as much as it was a contest of economics, or for that matter, armaments, Kissinger got something profoundly important right. And that as I come to write the second volume and take the story through the 1970s and the 1980s, I'm going to be telling a story not of a Cold War decided by economics, but rather of a Cold War decided by ideas, ideals even. I've nearly talked quite long enough for one evening and I'm keen to get to your questions. Thank you very much, Neil. Please give Neil a round of applause. <laughs> Neil's agreed to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to start by asking, uh, when did President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger first meet, and how did they, how did they get a, become acquaintance with each other? It's funny how nearly they met. There were a number of, of near misses. Kissinger would write to Nixon inviting him to come to Harvard uh, to speak at the international seminar, and Nixon would say no. And then in 1960, Nixon reached out to Kissinger uh, to see if Kissinger would switch from advising Nelson Rockefeller to advising him. Kissinger was so anxious to avoid this that he went on a trip to Japan just so that he wouldn't be around. <laughs> so part of the fascination of this story is that it is the most unlikely combination. They were the odd couple. And for most of this book, they were at odds. Kissinger explicitly criticized Nixon, said he was unfit to be president, sided with Nelson Rockefeller in three successive electoral contests trying to get Rockefeller the Republican nomination. So they didn't meet. 
And Kissinger based his view of Nixon, I think, and this is what I argue in the book, on the prejudices of his fellow Harvard professors or on the prejudices of the New York Upper East Side establishment that he encountered at the Council on Foreign Relations. And he essentially swallowed that elite view of Nixon that had been so firmly established uh, in the 1950s. When they eventually did meet in 1968, it was potentially a very awkward social moment. But unusually, in an awkward social moment, it was Richard Nixon who broke the ice. Because although he had not met Kissinger, he had read him. And he'd read quite a lot of Kissinger, because Nixon, as you all know, was a voracious reader. So they ended up talking about Kissinger's uh, first big bestseller, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. If you want to get on the right side of a Harvard professor, have read just one of his books. <laughs> and say how much you found it interesting. <laughs> this was the beginning of an extraordinarily important uh, relationship. And I think it had at its heart an intellectual affinity, but also perhaps some other affinities of the sort that I began my talk with. They had much in common, although there were some profound differences too. And that meant that when they finally did meet, they were pleasantly surprised to find that, as we would say today, they were on the same wavelength. We have a question at third row. Did Kissinger participate in either the 1960 or the 1964 presidential campaigns? Yes, he did. Uh, as an advisor uh, to Nelson Rockefeller, uh, but not only to Nelson Rockefeller, in 19. 60, as I mentioned, once it was clear that Rockefeller couldn't get the nomination, uh, and once it was clear that, that Nixon was going to, Kissinger actually ended up working for John F. Kennedy. And indeed, in 1960, uh, Kennedy successfully brought him into his administration. So part of the story of, uh, of Volume 1 is the pretty unsuccessful first attempt that Kissinger had at being a White House advisor. It all went horribly wrong, because he really wasn't quite enough of a swinger for Camelot. <laughs> Actually, what, what, what happened was that George Bundy completely stitched him up and made sure that he almost never saw Kennedy. And so Kissinger learned the hard way that presidential access is not just the most important thing, it's the only thing. In 1964, uh, in many ways, it was even more unpleasant because he was still a Rockefeller man, and he went to the, the, the convention in San Francisco uh, that nominated Barry Goldwater, and he was pretty scared by the Goldwaterites. Uh, they knew who he was. They did not like him, and he did not at all like the look of them. And this was a moment of revelation for him. Remember, as, as a refugee to the United States, who had then served in World War II and gone to Harvard, Henry Kissinger had not seen a whole lot of the United States of America. He'd only been to a handful of states by 1964. And so this was a kind of uh, shock encounter with an America, conservative America, that he really hadn't seen much of before. So he was involved in, in both those elections uh, and on the losing side, as he was again in 1968. Now, people often say, and indeed represent Kissinger in this way, that he was an incredibly calculating, power-hungry individual who was trying his hardest to get up the greasy pole of politics. If that were true, would he really have stuck with Nelson Rockefeller through three unsuccessful bids for the nomination? It strikes me that that was anything but a, a coolly calculating strategy. And my bottom line is that he, he was incredibly lucky when Richard Nixon offered him the job of national security advisor. He'd done almost nothing right to get that job. And he was so surprised when he got the offer that he didn't realize he'd been offered the job. It had to be done all over again. <laughs> We have a question in the first row. 
Uh, once, it, once Kissinger came to the conclusion that the Vietnam War could not be won, what did he do with that belief? Did he approach anybody? How did he handle his decision? That's a great question, and I, I answer it at length in the book. Well, he wrote um, a pretty bleak report analyzing what was going wrong, uh, and particularly analyzing the way every different US agency was doing a different thing, and there was almost no coordination between the different agencies. And meanwhile, the South Vietnamese regime was almost unsustainable in itself. So he wrote this kind of bleak report. Then he went back again in 66. He made three trips in all and went from asking the question, how can we salvage this, to asking the question, how can we get out of this? His view, which he thought through, I think, pretty carefully, was that you could not go directly to the North Vietnamese you had to go uh, via Paris, because after all, it, it had once been a French colony. So he spent much of 1967 in Paris trying to get a meeting with the North Vietnamese representative uh, there, in the hope that if he could only get that meeting, there, there could be some meaningful talks. It never happened. It was codenamed Operation Pennsylvania, it was one of many un unsuccessful attempts to start talks with the North Vietnamese. Eventually, McNamara uh, and later Johnson came to see that Kissinger was getting close. And he certainly was doing his level best. The problem was that the North Vietnamese were in no way sincere. They were, in fact, engaging in an, an elaborate feint ahead of the Tet Offensive. So I document this ultimately doomed enterprise to try to start negotiations with a completely cynical North Vietnamese regime that had no intention of making peace and was actually hoping to launch a decisive uh, offensive. When Ed's phone goes off, <laughs> there's a sort of terrible thought. C could it be your brother? Having spent, I have spent most of the afternoon here going around the, the exhibit with a wonderful guide, one of the docents here, Jerry Powell. And, and really, he brought your brother to life for me to, to an extent that was quite startling. Uh, so when your phone rang there, that was my immediate thought. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. This, I think, incidentally, um, tells us two things about Henry Kissinger. One, that he, from an early stage, from 65, and certainly 66, 67, wanted to end the Vietnam War. The notion that he had some gleeful desire to protract it is clearly uh, wrong. Secondly, it tells us something about him that, that makes him very human. And it also reveals something about the historian's fundamental problem. You can find out a lot from documents and from interviews. You can find out a lot if you do enough research. Most historians who've written about Henry Kissinger have not done enough research, but if, if you do enough research, you can find out a lot, but you can't find out everything. I really thought that he was in Paris purely in order to try to end the Vietnam War in 1967. And I had finished the book, and I was quite satisfied with that chapter, and I went to have dinner with my subject. Before dinner, Nancy, his wife, who clearly wasn't going to dine with us because there were only two places set, sat down and said to me, Neil, why do you think Henry was really in Paris in 1967? <laughs> and I said, I have no idea. I thought he was trying to end the Vietnam War. She said, I was studying at the Sorbonne in the summer of 1967. And it turned out that the reason he kept agreeing to these ultimately doomed diplomatic endeavors was that it gave him a perfect excuse to be in the same city as the woman he'd fallen in love with at that San Francisco Republican Convention in 1964. 
a relationship that they managed to keep completely quiet right down into the uh, 1970s. So, as a historian, you have to know your limitations. <laughs> You're trying to find the truth. And the truth is a lot out there, but sometimes, you know, there are things you can only, you can only find out if people tell you. We have a question in the back row. Hi, Neil. Hi. Um, we had quite a few email exchanges a couple of years ago. I'm yes. from Chapman University. Good, good to see you. I hope I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the only professor from Chapman, uh, or, or only professor in the audience. Uh, one question is about uh, Kissinger's role in this book. Uh, is he reading your manuscript while you're writing it? Uh, second question is, how are you managing time as a professor? As I'm writing my book myself, I feel like so difficult to manage so many challenges at the same time. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, for, thank you for asking. After I agreed to write the book, I said there's a condition. And the condition is that although you're going to give me access to your private papers, you're not going to have any say in what I write. No editorial control. You'll just have to accept what I find, warts and all. I'd said exactly the same thing to the Rothschild family when I wrote the history of the Rothschild Bank in the 1990s. And my position was, in any case, although your private papers will be very important to this book, I'm going to look at a whole bunch of other stuff too. And I'm going to talk to your enemies as well as to your friends. So be aware. Um, the only way I'm prepared to do this is on those terms. And we agreed. In fact, he said, I don't want to read it. I better not. Um, I, I want you to find, get as close to the scholarly truth as you can. I have confidence in you as a historian, and that is better from my vantage point than, than anything else could be. Once I got to the point of writing, I'd interviewed him a good deal. But it occurred to me that it wouldn't be a bad idea if he read the draft chapters to make sure, as in the case of Paris 1967, there weren't things that he knew that I didn't know because they weren't documented. So he did read uh, each chapter in draft. And that became a kind of second round of interviews, much more focused than the first round because you know, when an old man is confronted by things he wrote when he was in his 20s or 30s, it's pretty new. I mean, I find that about things I wrote two years ago. But imagine <laughs> that you're reading something you wrote 50 years ago. So we, we found that those sessions were really productive. And I learned a lot of stuff that I would never have found out had I not got him to read the, to read the drafts. And, and it's a sign that this ultimately worked, that after the finished book landed on his desk, he went through at least a month of being absolutely furious with me and, and really, really rejecting the book because ultimately I'd revealed too much, more than he was comfortable with. Uh, I think that, that, that phase has passed, but it was a pretty tricky phase when he finally looked at the the end product. How did it get written? I have spent a long time on this book, roughly 10 years from beginning to end, but most of the really hard work was done in the last two and a half. The research gathering, the acquisition of material is something that can go on in the background. You just need one really good researcher to do that while you're teaching. So I had a wonderful man, J Jason Rocket, who came here, who came everywhere, who was running around the United States and then the world, harassing innocent archivists and librarians, <laughs> demanding that they hand over uh, documents relating to Henry Kissinger. That went on in the background until we had enough. One last tip, grow a beard. I grew a beard in the final phase of the operation as a commitment device. I wasn't allowed to shave until the book was finished. The, the beard was frightful. It aged me horribly because it was mostly white. And every time I looked in the mirror, there was this old bearded Scotsman. And the only way to get rid of him was to finish the bloody book. 
Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks. Neil will be in the lobby to sign your book. Uh, please come back to Ann Romney next week. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.